This is the motto of the show, Hour of the Truth. Rome never changes. They used to call us heretics and sent the Inquisition to kill us. Today they call us terrorists and send on their crusades. Times and methods may have changed, the goal still stays the same. Extirpate the remnant of the true word of God, Bible believing people who will hold the truth in Jesus Christ's name. Suffering at the hands of Rome Cause they believed in Christ alone They died through Europe, especially Spain For they saw all but Christ is vain He suffered by His death for men To save them from their awful sin Six hundred years of martyred saints that history cannot erase with iron heel and iron hand the Roman popes rule the land those ignorant of history may be swept into apostasy we won't be loved by Rome, sweet lie With fifty million reasons why Salvation is by faith alone In Christ alone, by grace alone A sovereign God give faith to man Salvation's in the Maker's hand This gospel offends Rome today they offer up another way, a counterfeit, a compromise. Beware the ancient papal lie with such a cloud of witnesses who by grace died in their Lord. Recall their memory to say, by the same faith we live today. Hello everybody and welcome again to a new video from Joggler 66 Hour of the Truth. I first thought that after I recorded um, this book reading with the Hypercam video which records my desktop and at the same time uh, records my voice, um, that afterwards when I put that file into Movie Maker and uh, make a little video out of it the quality would still be good but I saw with the very first movie uh, with the very first video um, that the picture quality is much better in the uh, directly recorded Hypercam video AVI file so uh, when I upload it on my first channel the very first part you know with the um, with the dedication, the introduction of mine and the preface that I read, I saw that the quality was a little bit worse, so I decided just to take these um, uh, recordings that I do directly with Hypercam, so in, in that of course I'm a little bit limited what uh, is concerning other pictures in there, because you know I just uh, tell the screen what to record and then I record the different pictures so now I've started and uh, I take only this hypercam video and will be doing my reading for the next hour and of course after this little introduction with the technical views that you understand why the video is like what it is because you know the first AVI file took 18 gigabytes on my computer so <laughs> and it took it took for hours to upload on YouTube, so um, with that I'm a little bit restrained. In Movie Maker file, it is only about 250 or 200 uh, or 300 me uh, gigabytes, uh, megabytes. So that's uh, a little bit of difference, right? Anyway, I decided now to uh, record this book reading, uh, the history of the Inquisition, uh, only with this Hypercam video tool. And um, that's where I'm going to continue right now in the reading where we left off last time, the introduction. 
being the history of persecution. As religion is a matter of the highest importance to every man, there can be nothing which deserves a more impartial in, uh, inquir inquiry or which should be examined into with a more disinterested freedom. Because as far as our acceptance with the deity depends on the knowledge and practice of it, so far religion is and must be to us a purely personal thing, in which therefore we ought to be determined by nothing but the evidence of truth and the, con and the rational convictions of our own mind and conscience. So, of course, this was another example of the long sentences that uh, at that time were written. And I don't want to go into too much commenting, but I have to point out that what the author says here, that religion is purely a personal thing in which therefore we ought to be determined by nothing but the evidence of truth and our own mind and conscience is exactly opposite to what the Pope teaches, to what the Roman Catholic Church teaches, what Roman Catholic dogma was, is and will be all the time, because Rome does not change in that regard. So when you are a member of the ecumenical movement, you call yourself a Protestant and you still are going to these nowadays churches and enjoy your services, the, your communion, your fellowship over there, you have to understand that your church is under the wings of Rome and Rome does not accept you having a purely personal relationship with Jesus Christ and does not accept that you are having convictions of your own mind and your own conscience and your conscience is guided by the Bible and the Bible alone by Jesus Christ your Savior and not by the Pope. That is where the Roman Catholic Church differs, of course, from what is taught in the Bible. This is why, of course, we are reading this book about the history of the Inquisition, because the Roman Catholic Church persecutes everyone who has their convictions of their own mind and conscience relating to the Word of God. So I didn't want to come in too much, but I had to say this little sentence, at least here in the introduction, that you understand that. And I am not a Roman Catholic bigot. No, but it is important to make these points, to make the people understand where the difference is between Protestantism, between Apostolic Christianity and the Roman Catholic Church. Otherwise, it is absolutely futile to even start on reading this book. If you see, accept the Roman Catholic Church at Christendom, then you will never understand why this book has been written. But okay, let's continue now. And I hope I made my point that you understand that as far as religion goes for a person, it must be a personal conviction, a personal thing. I must have a personal relationship with my God, with my Savior, with my Lord, with my King, Jesus Christ. And I am convicted by my own mind and conscience based on the Bible and my conscience given to me by my Creator, Father in Heaven. Without such an exempt, uh, examination and conviction, we shall be in danger of being imposed on by crafty and designed men, who will not fail to make their gain of the ignorance and credulity of those they can deceive, nor scruple to recommend to them uh, the worst principles and superstitions, if they find them conducive or necessary to support their pride, ambition and avarice. Well, these crafty men we will get to know a little bit later, they are called the Jesuits. The history of almost all ages and nations is an abundant proof of this assertion. God himself, who is the object of all religious worship, to whom we owe the most absolute subjection and whose actions are all guided by the difference 
by by the discerned uh, reason and fit and and uh, fitness of things cannot as i apprehend consistent with his own most perfect wisdom require of his reasonable creatures the explicit belief of or actual assent to any proposition which they do not or cannot either wholly or partly understand because this requiring of them a real impossibility no man being able to stretch his faith beyond his understanding i e to see an object that was never present to his eyes or to discern the agreement or disagreement of the different parts of a pro uh, proposition the terms of which he hath never heard uh, he has never heard of or cannot possibly understand this is a very important part uh, because you know we see here um, that faith beyond his understanding to see an object that was never present to his eyes well the bible explains to us explicitly um, that faith is the evidence of the things not seen but the things hoped for and the evidence of things not seen and this is exactly what it is about that is faith if i quote unquote knew it because i've seen it then there would not be faith right but it is faith through that we are saved it is faith imputed by jesus christ on us by which we are saved and that is something that we have to understand here in, in this part faith is something else than knowledge but your faith can be that strong that your mind is convinced of even having the knowledge of it you know there was this example from this one apostle after jesus christ resurrected who could not believe that it was him and jesus said well come touch me and after he touched him he fell down and worshipped him and then jesus christ said well you saw and touched me you saw and believed how much more worth are those people who have not seen and believed through faith kind of those terms you get the gist that's how it stands in the bible and that's the point we have never seen jesus christ in person we have never seen him resurrected we have never met him but we have faith that he is there that he was there that he died for us that he rose to life that he went up to the father in heaven and that he still is there and keeps us through the holy spirit whom he sent when he descended up to heaven neither can it be supposed that god can demand from us a method of worship of which we cannot discern from reason and fitness because it would be to demand from us worship without understanding and judgment and without the concurrence of the heart and conscience i.e a kind of worship different from and exclusive of that which in the nature of things is the most excellent and best the exercise of those pure and rational affections and that, uh, and that imitation of god by purity of heart and the practice of the virtues of a good life in which the power substance and efficacy of true religion doth consist it therefore if therefore nothing can or ought to be believed but under the direction of the understanding nor any scheme of religion or worship to be received but what appears reasonable in itself and worthy of god the necessary consequence is that every man is bound in interest and duty to make the best use he can of his reasonable powers to examine without fear all principles before he receives them and all rights and means of religions and privilege of human nature which no man ought ever to part with himself and of which he can be deprived by others without the greatest injustice and wickedness will i doubt not appear evident beyond contradiction to all who impartially consider the history of past and uh, of past ages and nations that where whenever men have been abridged or wholly deprived of this liberty or have neglected to make the due and proper use of it or sacrificed their own private judgments to the public conscience or the pope's conscience 
or complemented the licensed spiritual guides with the direction of them, ignorance and superstition have proportionably prevailed. And that to these causes have been owing those great corruptions of religion which have done so much dishonor to God, and wherever they have prevailed been destructive to the interests of true piety and virtue. So that instead of serving God with their reason and understanding, they have served their spiritual leaders without either, and have been so far from rendering themselves acceptable to their Maker, that they have the more deeply to so feared incurred his displease, because God can't but dislike the sacrifice of fools, and therefore of such who either neglect him to improve the reasonable powers he hath given them, or part with them in compliance to the proud, ambitious and ungodly claims of others, which is one of the highest instances of folly that can possibly be mentioned. I will not indeed deny, but that the appointing persons who peculiar of whose peculiar office it should be to minister in the external services of public and social worship is, when under proper regulations of advantage to the decency and order of divine service. But then I think of it the mo uh, but then I think it of the most pernicious consequence to the liberties of mankind and absolutely inconsistent with the true prosperity of a nation, as well as with the interest and success of rational religion, to suffer such ministers to become the directors general of the conscience and faith of others or publicly to assume and exercise such a power as shall oblige others to submit to their determinations without being convinced of their being wise and reasonable, and never to dispute their spiritual decrees. The very claim of such a power is the highest insolence, and an affront to the common sense and reason of mankind. And wherever it is usurped and allowed, the most abject slavery both of soul and body is almost of unavoidable consequence. For by such a submission to spiritual power the mind and conscience is actually enslaved, and by being thus rendered passive to the priest, men are naturally prepared for a servile subjection to the prince and for becoming slaves to the most arbitrary and tyrannical government. And I believe it hath been generally found true by existence, that the same persons who have asserted their own power over others in matter of religion and conscience, have also asserted the absolute power of the civil magistrate, and have been the avowed patrons of those admirable doctrines and passive obedience and non-resistance for the subject. Our own nation is sufficiently witness to the truth of this. Tis therefore but too natural to suspect that the secret intention of all ghostly and spiritual directors and guides in decrying reason, the noblest gift of God, and without which even the being of God, and the method of our redemption by Jesus Christ would be of no more uh, significancy to us, then to the brutes that perish, beasts that means, is in reality the advancement of their own power and authority over the faith and conscience of others to which sound reason is and ever will be an enemy. For though I readily allow the great expediency and need of divine revelation to assist us in our inquiries into the nature of religion, and to give us a full view of the principles and practices of it, yet a very small share of reason without any supernatural help will suffice, if attended to, to let me know that my soul is my own, and that I ought not to put my conscience out to keeping to any person whatsoever, because no man can be answerable for it, to the great God, but myself. 
I highlighted this part of the sentence because I find this absolute crucial to understand before we even go into what the Inquisition is all about we understand that the author here is proclaiming the importance of the liberty of conscience the conscience of the people in the dark ages have not been free but has been directed by their leaders kings who have been ruled by the Pope priests who have been ruled by the Pope their conscience was stirred was ruled not by themselves but they were subject to the Roman pontiff to the Antichrist and here the author tells us my soul is my own and that I ought not to put my conscience out to keeping to any person whatsoever meaning no priest no bishop no cardinal no pope whatsoever because no man can be answerable for it to the great God but myself when I'm standing before God then I will be responsible for my conscience then I will be answerable to the great God for everything that I did I thought and I believed nobody else as nobody else can absolve me from sin but my Heavenly Father himself nobody else I can trust with my conscience if I do so I give up myself that of course is a very nice example of what the Jesuits are all about because they completely give their conscience away to their superiors perende ac cadaver huh? they are obedient to their superiors like a cadaver and that is the big difference with us because we are living because we believe in the living God my soul is my own well my soul actually is not my own because my soul is of my father my heavenly father but my soul is my own in that regard that I do not give away the control of my soul to anybody else in that far my soul is my own it is mine to give or to surrender my soul to anybody else and if I surrender my soul to somebody else then I am nothing else but a dead person because my soul is what makes me live right God breathed, breathed the breath of life into man and man became a living soul right so when I give up that soul then I am not master over myself anymore my soul is my own and that I ought not to put my conscience out to keeping to any person whatsoever because no man can be answerable for it to the great God but myself and that therefore the claim of dominion whoever makes it either of mine or any other conscience is mere imposture and cheat that has nothing but impudence or folly to support it and as truly visionary and romantic as the imaginary power or persons disordered in their senses and which would be of no more significance and influence amongst mankind than theirs did not either the views of ambitious princes the superstitions and folly of bigots encourage and support it on these accounts it is highly incumbent to all nations who enjoy the blessings of a limited government who would preserve their constitution and transmit it safe to prosperity to, to post posterity to be jealous of every claim of spiritual power and not to enlarge the authority and jurisdiction of spiritual men beyond the bounds of reason and revelation very important sentence 
On these accounts that we've just read, it is highly incumbent on all nations who enjoy the blessings of a limited government. What is a limited government? A limited government is a government that rules the people by their own choice, like a democracy, if it is done correctly, like a republic, if it is done correctly, like you guys over there in the United States have a republic, a limited government. An unlimited government is a monarchy, an absolute monarchy, of which there are a few examples in this world today. One is, for example, in uh, Saudi Arabia, and that is an absolute monarchy. And of course, the Pope in Rome, the Vatican, is an absolute monarchy. In Saudi Arabia, of course, it is an absolute monarchy only concerning their people. That king is, of course, subservient to the Pope. Let's not get that misunderstood, please. Yeah? But the point that I am making here is, on these accounts that I've just said, it is highly incumbent on all nations who enjoy the blessings of limited government, who would preserve their constitution. What are you doing in America over there? Do you preserve your constitution? Or are you giving it away by, for example, having six Catholics and three Jews on your Supreme Court that interprets the so-called Protestant constitution? and transmit it to save, uh, save to post, uh, posterity, to be jealous of every claim of spiritual power. But the Pope says that the spiritual power reigns over the temporal power. The spiritual rules over the temporal. The two keys of the Vatican flag, silver and gold, and the golden one lays above the silver one, means that the spiritual power is above the temporal power. So when people install their own government, which is a limited government to serve the people and not the people to serve the government, that is of course absolutely opposed of the dogma of the Roman Catholic Church, of the Roman Pontiff, of Pontifex Maximus, of the Antichrist of the Bible because he says that his spiritual leadership is above the temporal. Let them have the freest indulgence to do good, and spread the knowledge and practice of true religion, and promote peace and goodwill amongst mankind. Those are the workings of a limited government. A government, as you all like to say, by the people, of the people, for the people. Well, the only government of the people, by the people and for the people is a government based on the Bible. The Bible is the government of the people, for the people, by the people, on the principles of God, of the God of the Bible, of the Creator of all things, and of Jesus Christ. Let's get that right. Let them have the freest indulgence to do good and spread the knowledge and practice of true religion, Bible religion, and promote peace and goodwill amongst mankind. Let them be applauded and encouraged and even rewarded when they are patterns of virtue and examples of real piety to their flocks. Such powers as these God and men would readily allow them, and as to any other, I apprehend they have little right to them, and am sure they have seldom made a wise or rational use of them. On the contrary, numberless have been the confusions and mischiefs introduced into the world and occasioned by the usurpers of spiritual authority. That is the Antichrist, that is the Roman Catholic Church, the usurper of spiritual authority. The spiritual authority that is given to the Holy Spirit in this world, who has to come, and to everybody personally, of course. 
but the papacy usurps the spiritual authority. In the Christian Church, they have ever used it with insolence and generally abused it to oppression and the worst of cruelties. And though the history of such transactions can never be a very pleasing and grateful task, yet I think on many accounts it may be useful and instructive, especially as it may tend to give men an abhorrence of all the methods of persecution and put them upon their guard against, the, uh, against all those ungodly pretensions by which persecution hath been introduced and supported. But how much forever the persecuting spirit hath prevailed amongst those who have called themselves Christians, yet certainly it is a great mistake to confine it wholly to them. We have instances of persons who were left to the light of nature and reason, and never suspected of being perverted by revelation, uh, murdering and destroying each other on the account of religion, and of some judicially condemned to death for differing from the orthodox, i.e. the established idolatry of their country. And I doubt not, but that if we had as full and particular an account of the transactions of the different religious sects and parties amongst the heathens, as we have of those amongst Christians, we should find a great many more instances of this kind and is easy or possible now to produce. However, there are some very remarkable ones which I shall not wholly omit. We come over to section 1 of persecutions amongst the heathens upon account of religion. There is a passage in the book of Judith which intimates to us that the ancestors of the Jews themselves were persecuted upon, uh, upon account of their religion. There is a passage in the book of Judith, the author continues here. In the book of Judith, uh, he even says here in a footnote, it's uh, chapter 5, verse 6 of that book, is a part of the Apocrypha. And um, he will go through more mentions of the Apocrypha even in this book here and of course I do not go into that because the Apocrypha are not inspired books by the Word of God. That's why they are the Apocrypha and not in the King James Bible. But that doesn't take away anything of him mentioning it here and here and there of course it will even widen our understanding of history because in the book of uh, Judith and the book of Maccabees and uh, other books in the Bible, uh, there were written some very interesting things historically that are correct. But it is that the overall book is not the inspired word of God, that is why it is not uh, part of the King James Bible. And that's why, of course, I will never go too deep into these. But I just want to explain to you that the author, of course, even uses the Apocrypha to make a point here and there that is probably uh, valuable. Achior, the author continues, captain of the sons of Ammon, gives Holosernes with his account of the origin of that nation. This people are this are the are descend oh sorry these people are descended of the Chaldeans, and they journeyed they are heretofore in Mesopotamia, because they would not allow the gods of their fathers which were in the land of Chaldea, for they left the way of their ancestors, and worshipped the, uh, the God of heaven, the God whom they knew. So they cast them out from the face of their gods, and they fled into Mesopotamia, and sojourned there many days. St. Austin and Marsham both took notice of this uh, tradition, which is farther confirmed by all the Oriental historians, who, as the learned Dr. Hyde tells us, anonymously affirm that Abraham suffered many persecutions upon the account of his opposition to the idolatry of his country, and that he was particularly imprisoned for it by Nimrod in Ur.
Some of the Eastern writers also tell, tell us that he was thrown into the fire, but he thought that he was miraculously preserved from being consumed in it by God. This tradition also the Jews believed, and it is particularly mentioned by Jonathan in his Targum upon Genesis 11, verse 28. Now, who is this Jonathan that is mentioned here? Uh, Jonathan Targum. I will leave these two links that you see blend into the video here from Wikipedia that you can do your own study on Jonathan and on Targum, who that is yourself. I will not go into that right now. I leave that up for your own uh, study that you understand that. So early anyway, doth persecution seem to have begun against the worshippers of the true God. So the author is going back here even to Abraham and telling that Abraham was persecuted by the people of Ur, by Nimrod of Ur. Of course the persecution of the true God, believing God, following people, has always been there from the beginning. And this is another account of it. Now the author continues, Socrates, who in the judgment of an oracle was the wisest man living, was persecuted by the Athenians on the account of his religion, and when past, uh, and when past 70 years of age, brought to a public trial and was condemned. His accusation was principally this, that he did unrighteously and curiously search into the great mysteries of heaven and earth, that he corrupted the youth, and that did not even that did not esteem the gods worshipped by the city to be really gods, and that he introduced new deities. This last part of his accusation was undoubtedly owing to his incalculating upon them more rational and excellent conceptions of the deity than were allowed by the established creeds of his country, and to his arguing against the corruptions and superstitions which he saw universally Catholic practiced by the Greeks. This was called corrupting the youth, who were his scholars, and what, together with his superior wisdom, raised him many enemies amongst all sorts of people, who loaded him with reproaches and spread reports concerning him greatly to his disadvantage, endeavoring thereby to prejudice the minds of his very judges against him. When he was brought to his trial, Several of his accusers were never so much as named for, uh, or discovered to him. Do you understand this? When he was brought to his trial, several of his accusers were never so much as named or discovered to him. That's something that we will learn when we go into the coming Inquisition, what this book is all about. You didn't even know who was accusing you and who was judging you. His accusers were never so much as named or discovered to him. So that he, uh, so that as he himself complained, he was, as it were, fighting with a shadow when he was defending himself against his adversaries, because he knew not whom he opposed, and he had no one to answer him. Yes, and that's the same thing the United States of America established with the Patriot Act. The people of America, of the United States of America, have lost all their rights with that Patriot Act, which exactly does the same thing. You can be apprehended in the middle of the night by your government and taken into some prison, whether in the United States or anywhere over the world, can be tortured, can be accused of things that, and you will never see your persecutors. Exactly as it was done here with Socrates. There is one big difference between the Inquisition and the accusers of Socrates, as we will learn when we go further in this book, because the accusers of Socrates, even though accusing him of, uh, you know, corrupting the youth and uh, introducing other gods, um, they were not 
priests. That's the difference with the Inquisition, where the accusers always were priests. Okay? That's a little difference, but that's not so important in this case. What's important is the resemblance that when he was brought to his trial, several of, of, his, of his accusers were never so much as named or discovered to him, so that as, him, uh, as he himself complained, he was, as it were, fighting with a shadow when he was defending himself against his adversaries because he knew not whom he opposed and had no one to answer him. However, he maintained his own innocence with the noblest resolution and courage. Shoot, he was far from corrupting the youth and openly declared that he believed the being of a god. And as the proof of this, his belief, he bravely said to his judges that though he was very sensible of his danger from the hatred and malice of the people, yet that as he apprehended God himself had appointed him to teach his philosophy, so he should grievously offend him, should he forsake the station through, uh, the station through fear of death or any other evil, and that for such a disobedience to the deity they might more justly accuse him as not believing there were any gods. Adding, as though he had somewhat of the same blessed spirit that afterwards rested on the apostles of Christ, that it were uh, that if they would dismiss uh, him upon the conditions of not teaching his philosophy any more, I will obey God rather than you and teach my philosophy as long as I live. Of course, we know that Socrates here was not referring to the God of the Bible, to another God, but that in this case does not matter. He was convinced of his true quote unquote religion, of his true quote unquote belief, okay, and he said, I will obey my God, I put here, rather than you, and teach my philosophy as long as I live. But of course, philosophy is of the devil. So he was even believing a lie, but that was not clear to him, because he did not believe in the God of the Bible, who he even didn't know. Anyway, the author continues, however, notwithstanding the good uh, the goodness of his cause and defense. He was condemned for impiety and atheism and ended his life with a draught of poison, dying a real martyr for God and the purity of his worship. Thus we see that in the ages of natural reason and light, not to be orthodox or to differ from the established religion, was the same thing as to be impious and atheistical and that one of the wisest men that had ever lived was put to death merely on account of his religion. That is the point the author wants to make. Even though Socrates was understood as being one of the wisest men ever to live, he was put to death merely on account of his religion. And we are not even discussing whether this religion is righteous or unrighteous, if it is the true religion or if it is false religion, the point is that the accepted wisest man who ever at that time, up to that time, lived was put to death merely on account of his religion. And that is the whole point of the Inquisition. People are merely tortured and put to death on account of their religion, because their belief differs from the belief of the Roman Catholic Church. If you believe anything else that the Roman Catholic Church teaches, you are a heretic and you will be put to death merely on account of your belief, of your religion that you follow. If that religion is the pure religion of Jesus Christ, the Bible, sola scriptura, and the Bible and Jesus alone, you will be put to death 
merely on account of that belief that you follow that stirs your conscience. The very next sentence is what I just told you a few minutes ago. I must add, said the author, in justice to the laity, that the judges and accusers of Socrates were not priests. Melitus, one of the accusers, was a poet, Anitus, an artificer, and Lycan, an orator, so that the prosecution was truly laic, and the priests don't appear to have had any share in his accusation, condemnation, and death. Nor indeed was there any need for the assistance of priestcraft in this affair. The prosecution of this excellent man perfectly agreeable to the constitution and maxims of the Athenian government, which had, to use the words of, the, of a late reverend author, incorporated or made religion a part of the laws of the civil community. So what do we see here? We see that Religion made a part of the laws of the civil community. What is that? This is the first sign of a combination of state and church. That is what makes the fourth beast of Daniel differ from all the other beasts. Because it combines church and state. The Pontifex Maximus, the emperor of the Roman Empire, is also the high priest of the Roman Empire. And there you have the impersonation in the same person of spiritual guidance and temporal guidance. Meaning that religion is part of the laws of the civil community. Here it was in the beginnings in Greece. We are speaking about Greece. Greece then fell and was uh, then taken over by Rome, the last empire, and that last empire is so different from all the others because it absolutely incorporated religion into the laws of the civil community. Here it is only religion made a part of the laws of the civil community. It's a beginning. Rome perfected that. Rome, the empire that followed the Grecian Empire, what we are speaking here about. Yeah? Now, continuing. One of the Attic laws was to this effect. Quote, Let it be a perpetual law and binding at all times to worship our national gods and heroes publicly according to the laws of our ancestors. Unquote. Very important sentence. This could have been written by the Talmudic Jews at Jesus' time at absolutely the same time, with absolutely the same content. Let it be a perpetual law and binding at all laws to worship our national gods and heroes publicly according to the laws of our ancestors. Jesus accused the Pharisees and Sadducees to put that tradition above the word of God. And here, you have exactly the same thing among the heathens. Let it be a perpetual law and binding at all times to worship our national gods and heroes publicly according to the laws of our ancestors. So that no new gods nor new doctrines about old gods or any new rites of worship could be introduced by any person whatsoever without incurring the penalty of his law, which was death. Meaning, if you, like Socrates, was accused of, tried to change the traditions of the belief system that was in the Grecian Empire practiced at that time, bring in new gods or new doctrines the penalty of death was waiting for you. So that no new gods nor new doctrines about old gods and of course be vigilant of old gods speaking about a plural so we are not speaking about a biblical doctrine we are speaking about heathen doctrine 
Now, any new rights of worship could be introduced by any person whatsoever without incurring the penalty of this law, which was death. Thus, Josephus tells us that it was prohibited by law to teach new gods, and that the punishment ordained against those who should introduce any such was death. Agreeable to this, the orator Socrates, pleading in the Grand Council of Athens, puts them in mind of the custom and practice of their ancestors. Quote, this was their principal care to abolish nothing they had received from their fathers in matters of religion, nor to make any addition to what they had established. Unquote. And therefore, in his advice to Nicholas, he exhorts him uh, he exhorts him to be of the same religion with his ancestors, so that the civil establishment of religion in Athens was entirely exclusive and no toleration whatsoever allowed to those who differed from it. On this account, the philosophers in general were, by a public decree, banished from Athens as teaching heterodox opinions and corrupting the youth in matters of religion and by a law very much resembling the famous modern schism bill prohibited from being matters uh, masters sorry prohibited from being masters and teachers of schools without leave of the senate and people even under pain of death this law indeed like the others was but very short lived and uh, Sophocles, the author of it, punished in a fine of five talents. Uh, Lysimachus also banished them from his kingdom. It is evident from these things that according to the Athenian constitution, Socrates was legally condemned not for believing in the gods of his country and presuming to have better notions of the deity than his superiors. In like manner, a certain woman, a priestess, was put to death upon the accusation of her introducing new deities. Diogenes Laertius tells us that Anaxagoras, the philosopher, was accused of impiety because he affirmed that the sun was a globe of red-hot iron. <laughs> Which was certainly great heresy, because his country worshipped him as a god. Stilpo was also banished his uh, was also banished his country as the same writer tells us because he denied Minerva to be a god allowing her only to be a goddess and a goddess is inferior to a god a very deep and curious controversy this and worthy the uh, cognizance of the civil magistrate Diagoras was also condemned to death and the talent decreed to him that uh, and the talent decreed to him that should kill him upon his escape, being accused of deriding the, uh, the mysteries of the gods. Protagoras also would have suffered death had he not fled his country, because he had written something about the gods that differed from the orthodox opinions of the Athenians. Upon the same account, Theodorus, called Atheus, was also put to death. The Lacedaemonians constantly expel, uh, expelled foreigners and would not suffer their own citizens to dwell in foreign parts, because they imagined that both the one and the other tended to corrupt the weaken the, uh, tended to corrupt and weaken their own laws, nor would they suffer the, teach, uh, the teaching of rhetoric and philosophy because of the quarrels and disputes that attended it. The Scythians, who delighted in human blood, and were, as Josephus says, little different from beasts, yet were zealously tenacious in their own rights and put anarchists a very uh, anarchist Anarchist, sorry, a very wise person to death, because he seemed to be very fond of the Grecian rites and ceremonies. Herodotus, that is an uh, historian, Herodotus says that he was shot through the heart with an arrow by Solius, their king, for sacrificing to the mother of gods after the manner of the Grecians, and that Scyles, another of their king, was deposed by them for sacrificing to Bacchus, 
and using the Grecian ceremonies of religion and his head afterwards cut off by the uh, by uh, Olis, Olia Masades, who was chosen king of his uh, in his room. So rigid were they, says the historian, in maintaining their own customs and so severe in punishing the introducers of foreign rights. Many also amongst the Persians were put to death on the same account. And indeed it was almost the practice of all nations to punish those who, uh, or who uh, disbelieved or derided their national guards, as appears from Timocles, who, speaking of the guards of the Egyptians, says, How shall the, uh, the, uh, the, ice, the ibis or dog preserve me? And then adds, where is the place that doth not immediately punish those who have impiously taught the gods, such as are confessed to be gods? Juvenal gives us a very tragical account of some disputes and quarrels about religion amongst the Egyptians, who entertained an eternal hatred and in, uh, enmity against each other and eat and devoured one another because they did not all worship the same God. Now follows a little poem that I hope I can read understandably to you, otherwise just try to read it for yourself. Quote, Umbus and Tentire, neighboring towns of late, broke into outrage of deep festered hate. Religious spite and pious spleen bred first this quarrel which so long the bigots nursed. Each calls the other gods a senseless stock, his own divine though from the self-same block. At first both parties reproaches jar and make their tongues the trumpets of the war. Words serve but to inflame the warlike lifts who wanting weapons clutch their bony fists, that uh, yet thus make shift exchange such furious blows, scarce one escapes with more than half a nose. Some stand their ground with half their vis visage gone, but with the remnant of a face fight on. Such transformed spectacles of horror grow that not a mother her son should know. One eye remaining for the other spies, which now on earth a trampled jelly lies. Unquote. All this religious zeal hitherto is but mere sport and childish play, and therefore the piously proceed to farther violences, or to hurling of stones and throwing of arrows, till one party routs the other, and the conquerors feast themselves on the mangled bodies of their divided captives. Quote, Yet hitherto both parties think that fray, but mockers of war mere children's play. This weeds their rage to search for stones, an ombite wretch by headlong, freight, uh, straight betrayed and falling down uh, in throughout is prisoner made. Those flesh torn off by lumps the ravenous foe, and marvels cut to make it farther go. His bones clean picked, his very bones they gnaw, no stomach bulk because the corpse is raw. It had been lost time to, dr uh, to dress him. Keen desire supplies the want of cattle, spite and fire. Unquote. I hope I didn't butcher that too much, but that was really hard for me to, to read and try to understand these. Anyway, as you have read already, this is about devouring each other because they did not, at, uh, did not all worship the same God. So in these two poems, it is put a little bit together how people were persecuted cut into pieces, their flesh eaten and all that stuff, if they did not adhere to the religion that was imposed on them by the leaders. 
and that is the same as we have today. The religion that we should follow today is imposed by us by Pontifex Maximus, the Antichrist, the Roman Catholic Church. And their working is not much different from what is described here in these two poems. But let's read on. Plutarch also relates that in, this, uh, that in his time some of the Egyptians who worshipped a dog eat one of the, uh, of the fishes which other of the Egyptians adored as their deity. Okay? I hope I didn't butcher that too much that you understood that. Plutarch also relates that in his time some of the Egyptians who worshipped the dog eat one of the fishes which others of the Egyptians adored as their deity and that upon this fish eaters laid hold on the other's dogs and sacrificed and eat them and that is uh, and that this grave occasion to a bloody battle in which a great number were destroyed on both sides so the one is worshiping a dog and eats fish and the other one worships the fish and therefore eats the dog and they both go to battle because of their quote-unquote deity, because of their belief. Now I've come almost to one hour, but that's not the point. The point is that the next reading that we are going to start here is called The Introduction of the Book, starting with uh, Antiochus Epiphanes, who you probably know, and um, I will go into that in the next reading. So that for today I will stop here and leave you with a little bit of, um, well, how can I say that, <laughs> reflection on what you've heard and what you've read, probably, along with me. I still hope that you enjoy reading this book together with me, because here we are really taught some history that we are never taught in our schools, that we are never taught in our universities and that for sure we are never told if we are going into a so-called church. No priest, no pastor is ever gonna teach you what this book is all about. And I hope that after the dedication, the preface and now the introduction, when next time we go into what is called <laughs> the introduction, again, the next part of the introduction, starting with Antico uh, Antiochus Epiphanes, that then um, your eyes will be opened and you see why this is such an important book and about what is all not taught in this world that I think is absolutely necessary. Because if we don't have an understanding of the past, we can never understand the present and never make predictions for the future. Bible prophecy is history written in advance and we can measure Bible prophecy to be true when we compare it with the history past. But when the history past is not taught to us anymore, we have no knowledge of Bible prophecies being fulfilled. And if the Bible prophecies for our understanding have not been fulfilled, then we will lose our faith. And that is exactly what the Jesuits and what the Antichrist and what Satan wants, that we lose our faith in our God. Okay, up to here now. Thank you very much for listening, watching the video. Spread it as far as you can. And until next time, Jogla 66 from Hour of the Truth says God bless you. Signing off. Bye-bye.